Finally, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, um, uh, Nicolas fernandez Medina to introduce today's visiting speaker. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. Um, our speaker today is Leslie Harkema. She is a, uh, an assistant professor of Spanish and the director of undergraduate studies for Spanish at Yale University. Her primary research interests include 19th and 20th century peninsular literature, modern Hispanic poetry, literary responses to religious, political, and scientific discourse, tropes of youth and age in European modernism, and literature of exile and theory and practice of literary translation. Uh, Professor Harkema's current book project titled Spanish Modernism and the Aesthetics of Youth from Miguel de Unamuno to La Joven Literatura examines a little study of the relationship between Unamuno and several Spanish writers associated with the modernist generation, including Moreno Villa, Gerardo Diego, Ernesto Jimena de Caballero, and José de Lamin, focusing on youth as a central concept in their aesthetic thought and self-fashioning. The poetic tradition that binds these writers together brings to light the central role that the 20th century's reimagining of adolescence and youth played in the development of living modernism in Spain. And for those students of you, the graduate students who are in my course on um, decadentism and degeneration, this should be um, very palpable to you. This presentation is possible thanks to the Complement Lunch Series, the Department of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and the Spanish and Italian Modernist Studies Forum. Today, Leslie will be giving a talk titled Samples and Crustaceans, Fairing the Youth and Age in Spanish Modern Poetics. So please join me in welcoming Leslie to Penn State. Thank you very much. Thanks to Nicolás and to Maria for inviting me to this lecture, and thanks to the Lunch Series for having me. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm foraying into Prezi here. I'm going to be talking about a lot of images and poetry and running through a lot of poems, so wanted to have some visual. Um, but because of that, I'll be speaking from here. So I hope that you can all hear me um, as I begin. Uh, so I want to begin this talk um, by taking a look at a poem by Miguel de by Manuel Aldoraguirre, um, a Spanish poet born in Malaga in 1905 and most well known as one of the canonical members of the so-called generation of 1927, along with Federico Garcia Lorca, Rafael Alberti, and others. Much can be and has been said about this group and the historiographical framework of the literary generation about of which it is a product along with other generations in Spanish letters like the generation of 1898 or 1914. The fact that um, this model is structured around nationally specific cultural moments, um, and 1918 being the, the, ta the year of Spain's, the loss of Spain's last colonies, and 1927, the year of the um, commemoration of the death of Baroque poet Luis de Góngora. Um, this model, uh, it has been argued, um, separate Spanish literature from the rest of European culture during the 20th century and its national specificity, um, with the result that Spain is too often left out of discussions of European modernism. In my own research, however, I'm interested in the phenomenon of the literary generation in Spain as a recurring manifestation of one of modernism's uh, deepest obsessions, the fasc fascination with youth. At a time when adolescence was newly recognized as a stage of life distinct from both childhood and adulthood, modernists seized on, its, on it as an emblem of creativity and possibility, as well as, on, uh, as an anecdote, antidote to uh, the skepticism and resignation of an old order. In Spanish cultural production, the praise of youth in opposition to age is the common denominator, I argue, uh, shared by the su successive generations of the first third of the century. The members of the generation of 1927, in fact, referred to themselves in their day as la joven literatura, the young literature. Uh, but more than a simple preference for people who have not yet turned 40, to cite the uh, ill-fated number fixed by F.T. <coughs> Marinetti in his Futurist Manifesto, um, the constant thread that runs through Spanish modernist literature, and here I'm going to talk particularly about um, lyric poetry, is the rejection of a linear understanding of development, a resistance to the telos that orients human life toward adulthood or maturity. And a good example of this is that poem that I mentioned, um, El Toleguerre es Tiempo Flor, or Time is a Flower. And I'll just read the Spanish. All the translations in this presentation are my own. Que horror. Me parecía que aquel lejano niño se estaba yendo para siempre, que aquel alegre joven distraído se alejaba también 
Mentira todo. El joven está en mí como un hombre vestido de otros hombres, llegando hasta la última envoltura, esta piel mía de ahora, o siendo abrigo de otros cuerpos, hasta llegar al niño que yo era, que está en mí, en una inmensa flor que al deshojarse lo mostrara, desnudo y sombriente. In this poem, which was included in a 1936 collection, Alto Laguerre identifies the error of conceiving uh, time and development in linear terms, recognizing that his identity is made up of a succession of selves, like rings inside the trunk of a tree. He even seems to suggest that those previous selves, the young man, the child, may be rediscovered or reactivated. In challenging the assumption that time is unidirectional and irreversible, like a linear narrative progressing towards its conclusion, Alto Laguerre's poem echoes a key strain in the work of other moder modernists, from Bergson to Proust or to, jo to Joyce. The portrait of an art artist as a young man, of the artist as a young man, is a clear reference here. Frequently in re recent decades, critics have called attention to the questioning of the narrative of formation in modernist texts that choose to break with a 19th century buildings roman and celebrate the freedom of adolescent protagonists who refuse Peter Pan-like to grow up. Here I'm thinking of Franco Moretti's work on the European buildings roman, but also and more particularly of scholars of British and American literatures um, like Patricia Myers bax Stephen Burt, and most recently Jed Esty. Acknowledging the pivotal influence of American psychologist G. Stanley Hall, the so-called founder or father or inventor of adolescence, these scholars uh, observe a shift in views of youth that coincide roughly with um, the turn of the 20th century. To paraphrase Spax, if the Victorian period viewed adolescence as something that must, be that must inevitably come to an end as one accepts the responsibilities of adulthood, the modernist rebelled against such strictures and, in Spax's phrase, uh, set out to blaze new trails. Within the Spanish lyr lyrical tradition, one image pervasively re represents the linear view of human temporality, life, and development, that of a river flowing to the sea. Now we're going to go to the, the roots of the tree. Um, it comes from the 15th century poet Jorge Manrique, uh, who used the metaphor in his Coplas por la muerte de su padre, stands for the death of his father, and we have it there. Nuestras vidas son los ríos que van a dar en la mar que es el morir. The goal of my presentation today is to juxtapose two other images, that of the young tree, which I'll suggest in some ways grows out of the Manrican River, and that of the hard-shelled crustacean, whose genealogy is a bit more obscure. Nevertheless, I want to linger over this image for a moment. In Manrique's wake, as it were, uh, the equation of human life to the course of a river becomes the natural frame for reflections on maturation and the passing of youth in later Spanish poems. 19th century poet Carolina Coronado uh, makes use of it in her poem Los Quince Años, 15. Coronado's poetic voice recalls the Victorians studied by Spex as she bitterly laments the end of youth or childhood, while also viewing that end as completely unavoidable. Her mourning for innocence lost, which is also a loss of personal freedom for a young girl uh, coming of age in Spain's rigidly patriarchal society, uh, centers itself around a vision of the Manrican River. And I won't read this, but you can see that in the first stanza, this forms the center of the short poem. Um, the first stanza celebrates the birth of the spring, and then in the last lines we have um, a stark conclusion. Sigue su curso caminando, mira como se enturbia. With this last line, the destruction of purity is as abrupt as it is final. Coronado spends little time extolling the virtues of youth, for it is obvious that the water of this spring cannot be purified once it becomes cloudy, any more than its flow can be reversed. The poet sees the milestone of turning 15 as not merely a memento mori, but in fact a partial death. Worries and cares, which he calls largos afanes, are the only reward that awaits this young woman. And in the last line of the poem, she is referred to for the first time as an amante, a lover, um, but rather than evoking joy, that word r reads like a sentencing. The marriage or romantic relationship that looms before her, Carolina um, Coronado employs, implies, is a prison in which the woman will never retrieve her youth. To be sure, there is something very modern about Coronado's view of development, and particularly female development, in Los Quince Años. The outlook of the poem, particularly in its equation of romantic involvement when the impoverishment of a woman's experience, 
could fruitfully be compared to that of poems written later, like uh, American Edwin Arlington Robinson's Eros Turanos. Nevertheless, while it bemoans the young girl's fate, Coronado's poem does not imagine any alternative to its tragic close. Aging is an unchangeable force of nature. The existence of an intermediate stage between innocence and experience, childhood and, uh, and adulthood, remains largely inconceivable to her. And indeed, for Spanish women writers well into the 20th century, the emerging category of youth remained inaccessible in many ways. Associated with the privilege of higher education and with mi military service, youth as a concept or ideal would carry a masculine charge in much of early 20th century European culture, and the realm of Spanish letters is no <coughs> exception, and that in a way is uh, my attempt to explain why the, s the text I'm going to cite from um, hereafter are all from men. In the 20th century, the river image paired with the theme of growing up continues to appear in many poems, among them Vicente Alexandre's <coughs> Adolescencia, published in 1927, and Alto Aguirre's work as well. In my view, however, the metaphor of the tree eclipses that of the river in importance within Spanish modernism's treatment of youth. Romantic in origin, the image of the sapling enters the Castilian poetic tradition through a poet significantly older than Alexandre, Alto Aguirre, and their peers, and one not often associated with them, Miguel de Unamuno. Mm. In his 1906 poem, No busques luz mi corazón sino agua, uh, search not for light, my heart, but water, Unamuno uses the image of the tree as the allegorical focal point for a reflection not on youth per se, but certainly on a topic that is germane to human development, especially as Unamuno understood it, the conflict between intimate, intuitive self-knowledge and the reason of the external world. The poetic speaker imagines his own soul as a tree growing along the banks of a river, but notably he rejects the Manriquean metaphor. Using familiar second-person address, he urges his uh, soul tree to look for sustenance elsewhere, to sink its roots into the ground beside a quiet lake, rather than allow them to be exposed by the river's erosion <coughs> and scorched in the sunlight. Uh, and you have an expert from the poem that, that describes that. The poet here denounces the forward movement of the river, which he describes in the penultimate line as uh, a slave to destiny, in favor of the lake, just as elsewhere he uh, shuns the upward ambitions of the tree's branches and advocates for the roots. This turn away from what the poet calls the corrientes revueltas de la vida, the turbulent currents of life, constitutes not only a critique of linear understanding of development, but also a vindication of self-reflection and reverie, attributes that, according to comparatist John Neubauer, were central to the idea of adolescence that pervaded in the European fin de siècle. Um, at the end of the poem, Unamuno's tree comes to resemble Narcissus as it leans over the surface of the lake. He says, si, se miren tus frondas, the branches look at themselves in the reflection um, of the night sky. The writer um, Unamuno encourages this type of self-contemplation, linking it to both youth and poetry in several other contemporary essays from the turn of the century. And I'll give you just a few, Almas de Jóvenes, um, uh, souls of the young, adentro, inward, soledad, solitude, and el secreto de la vida, the secret of life. In all of these pieces, he employs the same intimate second-person address that appears in No Busques Luz to urge his reader to retreat from the exterior world and cultivate inner self-knowledge. Only then, he argues, can true creation take place, the kind that Unamuno referred to with the Greek word poesis. In this writer's view, young people are closer to poesis <coughs> because modern adulthood has not yet damaged their capacity for introspection. By the same token, maturity is associated with hardened dogmatism in Unamuno's early essays, particularly two, Viejos uh, y Jóvenes, The Old and the Young, or one called Ramplonería, which could be translated as mediocrity, although that doesn't get to quite all of it. In these texts, the writer deplores the fact that Spanish culture is run by men between the ages of 40 and 60 who have, to use the language of a later cultural moment, sold out. He writes that these leaders are older at heart even in, than they are in years, and that in order to arrive at their position of maturity and influence, each of them has adapted to reigning tastes, disowned himself, uh, and drowned out his unique spirit. These professionalized individuals, uh, intellectuals in short, are shells of their younger selves. In their resignation to bourgeois values and grasping after social respectability, they resemble the putrefactos that Salvador Dali, Pepin Bello, 
and Federico Garcia Lorca would make fun of in the 1920s. And there at the bottom you have an image of one of the many uh, drawings of putrefactos that uh, Dali did in the late 20s. Um, but Unamuno was thinking along these lines already decades earlier. In his essay, Soledad, also from 1906, he writes, Los más de los espíritus me parecen dermatoesqueléticos, como crustáceos, con el hueso fuera y la carne dentro. Um, and then at the end, to contrast, he says, um, El poeta es aquel a quien se le sale la car carne de la costra, a quien le resuma el alma. It should be noted that this language of encasement and liberation appears often in Unamuno's turn of the century writing, perhaps most famously at the end of his widely influential Entorno al Casticismo, regarding the cult of authentic tradition, published in 1895. In that text, he calls for a true youth, true youth and verdadera juventud to break Spain out of the bonds of traditionalism that hold it captive, or held it captive. The power of youth to rebel against entrenched ways of thinking is analogous in this writer's thought to the generative properties of poetry contrasted with the professionalized academic world of literary criticism controlled by aging authorities. And now to move to a different cultural moment, or historical moment rather. All of the essays by Unamuno that I've mentioned here were collected and published by Madrid's Residencia de Estudiantes, or student residents, between 1916 and 1919. One of the most important cultural and educational centers of early 20th century Spain, the Residencia was an institution founded in 1910 with the purpose of cultivating a new generation of Spaniards to intervene in the development of their country and bring about its own regeneration or rejuvenation. A consideration of this cultural mission at the Residencia makes me suspect that these particular essays by Unamuno were selected in part because of their intimate tone and concern with youth. Be that as it may, the collected ensayos, seven volumes in all, and you see the, the first one there on the left, um, became the medium through which students at the Residencia and other young people within the intellectual community it served were introduced to Unamuno's early thought. So for example, the writers of La Joven Literatura of the 20s um, first read En Torno al Casticismo, that text I just mentioned, in this edition. And the, the collection was edited by two poets, both of whom had strong ties to the Residencia, Juan Ramón Jiménez and José Moreno Villa. And it is precisely in the work of these two writers, I would argue, that the image of the sapling, the young tree, appears again in the 1910s. It is often an often cited fact in the histories of the Residencia that Jimenez um, both planted the garden at the center's uh, second and definitive campus and also gave it its poetic name, La Colina de los Chopos, the Hill of the Poplars. The symbolic connection between the trees and the young minds and bodies that would live and work in this new space is evident in a brief text he wrote as the grounds were being prepared in 1915. Above all, to Jimenez, those trees are a symbol of hope for the future. I quote, a promise of greenery, of gold, of slenderness, of light, of birds, on this hill only yesterday barren, close quote. Beyond the physical land, what Jimenez describes here is a vision for Sp the Spanish nation in its own process of development. A poem that he wrote at about the same time, called Octubre, um, reproduces this image of the tree as he imagines himself planting, planting his heart in the ground and watching it grow up. Um, Jimenez certainly did dedicate himself to the Residencia and the young people uh, that it served. He fostered the burgeoning of many of the poets who would uh, come into their own in the next decade um, and edited their work painstakingly in his journals. But perhaps because of his role as a mentor, however, his perspective on youth, youth tends to be that of the onlooker, the one who plants the tree and enjoys its beauty rather than the one who lives through the period of growth. In this, he differs from his fellow poet, Jose Moreno Villa, who also worked at the Residencia and in fact lived there almost without interruption in a kind of extended adolescence for nearly 20 years. So that's Moreno Villa. Just before the outbreak of the First World War <coughs> in the summer of 1914, Moreno Villa published his second book of poetry, El Pasajero. It contained a long poem titled En la Selva Fervorosa, In the Fervent Forest. Based on Moreno Villa's own experience as an adolescent studying in a foreign city, Freiburg, Germany, and in fact the forest in question here is the Black Forest, uh, the poem is a Bildungsgedicht of sorts, 
Over the course of its 25 short cantos, in, en la Selva Fervorosa tells the story of personal development following the unamuno of No Busques Luz in establishing an allegorical relationship between a tree growing in a forest and the soul of a young person trying to find his place in the modern world. The forest is often threatening and alienating. The poem frequently dwells on the isolation that the tree feels even in the midst of so many others. And in Canto V, the narrating voice exclaims, I, I don't have the quote up here, but, um, Por qué, señor, a la conciencia joven, a la raicilla que es apenas tallo, dejaste sola en la intricada selva, in English. Why, Lord, did you desert the young mind, the little root that is barely a stalk, in the solitude of the bewildering forest? This quote. With this youthful anxiety and insecurity comes also adolescent angst. In fact, to revise the assertion that I just made in calling it a Bildungsgedicht, uh, I would argue that En la Selva Fervorosa is, in the end, a poem not of formation, but of anti-formation, because it resists the pull toward maturity at every juncture. Where Manrique had spoken of a river running relatively peacefully toward the sea, Moreno Villa's arborescent protagonist juxtaposes this metaphor for, de for development with the violent threat of being chopped down by the lumberjack. And you have that there, pasa el rio, la vida y el leñador, el hacha. The axe is dangerous not only because it could bring death, but also because it may mutilate the tree's limbs. In Canto 8, Moreno Villa uses a strikingly corporal and anthropomorphic image to link this violence to the narrowing of possibility that is the inevitable effect of growing older. Um, it begins, Pero una tarde el hacha del leñador oscuro in un diose penetrante en mis axilas. Um, the protagonist laments the progressive limitation of his aspirations and increasing <coughs> alienation even from parts of himself as he grows up. Hopes and desires fall away like chopped branches, reified tokens of what Unamuno would call a yo ex futuro, the memory of a past self or a possible self. A possible self. This painful experience anticipates the tragic conclusion of the poem in which a fire destroys the entire forest. In one interpretation, this event could stand for the ultimate finality of death, but Moreno Villa writes of the scorched tree as bearing the visage and body of a man. Faz y cuerpo de hombre, he writes. The death of this sapling, symbol of a young poet's soul, marks the passage into a seasoned, hardened adulthood. En la Selva Fervorosa offers perhaps the most richly developed example of the intersection between modernist poetics in Spain and the resistance to formation in modernism broadly during the early 20th century. I would further argue that it is, it is invaluable for understanding much of Moreno Villa's work. Um, but moreover, his poetry, like Unamunos and Unamunos Aces, created a space for new reflections on development in the writing of the joven literatura of the 1920s. The tree Im images that appear frequently in Alto Laguerre's work, especially around the generational date of 1927, as, as well as the later poem that I cited at the beginning of the talk, seem to echo Moreno Villa's fervent forest. Alto Laguerre, uh, for his part, associates different life stages with parts of the tree. He talks about uh, troncos mayores, uh, elderly trunks, and young branches, and then child, the leaves as children. Um, Alto Laguerre idealizes the simultaneous existence of these different stages within one organism, extrapolated from their chronological ordering and converted into eternalized symbols. And incidentally, he returns to this plant-like conception of the relationship between youth and age years later in an essay on Unamuno, written after the older writer's death. Um, he writes, Se dice y opina con frecuencia que la obra de Unamuno es vieja, que Unamuno es un viejo también. Yo no comparto esta opinión, que por lo demás no me parece denigrante. La juventud de Don Miguel de Unamuno es más vegetal que humana. Depende de sus flores. So returning to the source, perhaps. And what are the crustaceans? It is true that uh, this memorable image from Unamuno's essay does not appear directly in Spanish lyric, although if anyone has an example to the contrary, I'd love to know about it. Um, but it does reemerge in the discourse surrounding poetry generated by the joven literatura of the 1920s. García Lorca seems to have been very taken with the idea as he underlined several of Unamuno's references to crustáceos in his own copy of the ensayos. I've already noted the similarities between this Unamunian concept and the putrefactos that Lorca and his colleagues scorned. 
Um, and in addition, the crustacean makes one important appearance in the pivotal event of the generation of 1927, the vindication of the 17th century poet, Luis de Góngora. As a celebration organized by young writers um, who rejected the tastes and critical norms of Spain's literary establishment and hoped to rejuvenate Spanish letters by championing a long forgotten maestro, the Góngora tercentenary is a key example of the modernist glorification of youth and rejection of age. In this light, I find the poet Gerardo Diego's account of the festivities held in Madrid on the anniversary of Góngora's death highly significant. Describing an auto da fe um, that the, poet, the young poet supposedly carried out in Góngora's honor, Diego writes that it opened with the burning of three effigies representing the enemigos de Góngora, fashioned by none other than Moreno Villa, who was also an artist, as it happens. Um, these were the figures of the old, dried out, resi resigned literary establishment, the anti-poets, the stuffy critics, and the academics, to whom Diego gave epithets like El Catedrático Marmota, the marmot professor, and of course, El Académico Crustáceo. So just to, to wrap up, um, Spanish modernism's revision of the narrative of formation does away with the narrative and turns to the alternative temporality offered in the lyric. Within this poetic context, the image of the tree embodies the possibility of continual growth and movement, while the crustacean incarnates the endemic paralysis and stagnation that Unamuno had diagnosed as the greatest, greatest malady of Castilian letters already in 1890, uh, 1895 in El Entorno al Castitismo. In this way, though they are not uh, human images, the modes of corporality that the sapling and the crustacean represent tie early 20th century Spain's concern with national and cultural development to the physical and spiritual conditions of age and adolescence. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to begin with a, with a question that um, leads from Otero uh, uh, and Dali's revision of this, right? Because where, uh, so this is based on the set of the sentimentalized donkey, right? He covered his work with dead carcasses of donkeys mm -hmm. as a kind of like perpetual motif. And, and, and I'm, I'm thinking of this because in, in Dali's work, you get a lot of sort of death coming out. Instead of this, you know, the squishy interior of the crab being sort of the living, jubilant youth, uh -huh. okay. you have like ants, uh -huh. right? So this sort of putrescence is the kind of uh, counter logic. Um, so in, in, in just thinking about the, the sort of a literary history based on trees and rivers and crustaceans as well, um, and in thinking about Dali as a kind of like, you know, explicit dialectical inversion mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. it's still within the framework of a certain kind of like nat naturalism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, in the literal sense, not even the kind of, well, both ways actually, the histolog historicity and also nature images. And I'm wondering if there's a sense in, in which the very model of historicity itself might be changing in the sense that, like, you know, nothing's older than youth, <laughs> right? So it's not just old people that have to be done away with, but old images, in a sense, right? So the youth as a kind of fetish has a certain ageiness to it. And so uh, the other ways in which there's a kind of pressure put on youth, but also on the, on the naturalism of these images themselves. Do you see that being kind of uh, shaken a little bit? Um, pressure put, it, put on youth, uh, or youth undermined as a concept? Right, yeah. both, both youth as an operative yeah. concept, um, as in the youth of the, of the writer, uh -huh. <laughs> um, but also the, the naturalness by which that youth is, is figured. Um, a good question. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, and Dali is the perfect uh, contrast to Namuno um, because you're right, the physical metaphors that they use to speak about decay are completely the opposite. Um, I uh, often think that uh, if uh, we're talking about modernity as um, all that is solid uh, melts into air, that sort of idea, Unamuno sees the reverse happening. All that is fluid hardens to stone. Um, so I, I would say that that's true, and this gets into some questions of, of the avant-garde as well. But um, hmm, 
it's a, it's a really great case. And I'm not sure what else I can say about it. The naturalness of youth. Um, it does become a fetish in a lot of ways within. It's, it's completely um, something that's uh, impossible to retain. Um, but at the same time, in a lot of these writers that I'm talking about, it becomes associated with the poetic itself, with a trans-historical um, aesthetic moment. Um, so that's the direction that I'm most interested with these writers. And these writers are operating within what we could call a very modernist um, highbrow literary tradition within Spain. So the place to look, starting with Dali, um, in Spanish literature is in the other sorts of um, communities that were uh, at work in Spain at this time. Let me try to question. Leslie? <coughs> I, I really looked at it going to Jonathan's question about coming back much earlier for someone like Mina mm -hmm. Muno, concept of naturalness. Have you looked at the, the kind of Krauss's backdrop to a lot of this a lot of these concepts of youth and generation in Spain? Absolutely. And, yeah. and how that might inform um, these, these ideas of naturalness because Krauss's philosophy was imbued in romantic naturalism and natural philosophy. So. Mm -hmm. Did you, did you see some of that, especially Absolutely. in someone like Namuna? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, well, the, the Residencia is maybe the final manifestation of Krauss's philosophy in Spain, which is an incorporation of German idealism, right, into uh, Spanish modern, uh, modern Spain. Um, and with that comes a certain view of history as well, um, and a certain idea of um, continual perfection and a progress that I really find Unamuno, while he was very influenced with, by Krausism, I find him resisting that at many turns. So it's interesting to see how the Residencia frames Unamuno's essays, for example, because they pick the ones that are most about youth, um, you could cynically say, um, because they wanted to use uh, these texts to cultivate a certain idea of a national youth, right? Um, and uh, I'm very interested in how this relates to a concept of the nation. The only reason I bring it up is that it was through the Krauss's that the, the notion of nature walks, planting trees, mm -hmm. and that whole education outside, mm -hmm. aesthetics, body culture in Spain really takes hold in the late 19th century. Yes, yeah, and that's also much part of it. Yeah, I wonder, is there any way in which the linkage of youth and modernism as a kind of dark underside. Absolutely. For, 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 for example, for, for lack of a better word, say fascism. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> but, that's right. Yeah, right. right. So how does, how, does, how, does, how, does that, how does that manifest you know, right. as, as a sort of complement of, of what you've been talking about? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Well, um, even beginning with uh, the beginning of the century with uh, Stanley Hall's theor theorist of adolescence, um, Adolescence is also seen as a site of potential pathology, right? Of, of um, delinquency, of um, uh, threats to the nation. What's interesting is that that becomes later on a very, beginning with the First World War, um, the nationalist model uh, of, uh, we were talking about vitalism earlier, um, the vitalist um, figure of youth becomes completely um, interwoven with the nation. And that, of course, leads to, to fascism. So the really interesting thing in my work um, with Unamuno is that he's taken in, in all directions at once. Um, so he's incorporated into the Spanish fascist discourse of the nation. Um, and in the 19, late 1920s, you have Ernesto Jimenez Caballero talking about La Joven España and talking about Entorno al Casticismo de Italia and talking about Unamuno as a proto-fascist. Um, so that's a very pivotal moment and it affects how we read Unamuno today as well or the criticism on him. Um, but it goes the other way too. He was read by communists and, and who really rejected this sort of violent take. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't know anything about this literature, so let me preface my question by saying that the um, Mm. Above, with the tree, but down by the roots. Can you yeah. Go back to that poem? Yeah. Um, 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I wonder if you could talk about that, because it's quite disruptive mm -hmm. in terms of the standard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, absolutely, like I can look at it. Yes. The my soul. No, it's the not idea. Of my, much better it is my soul to where it is. Uh huh. Exactly. Um, and in this poem, he is. I mean, we don't have a specified young um, reader or addressee in this poem. So he is. He's doubling himself and talking about. Um, a soul, which uh, according to this logic of uh, the body in Unamuno might be conceived of as a younger self. Um, but you're right, there's a way in which uh, this second person address is a way, a um, means of controlling uh, the, the, the addressee and of talking about, um, of kind of framing youth, I would say. Um, and Right. My soul. Exactly. <laughs> yes, and that's but that's what he's doing. He's doubling himself here and uh, still remaining present in the situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. In his work, it does. There are many places where he will do this sort of address um, within the specific context. I think this situation is particular, but. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about it that way at all, but it certainly could be. He doubles himself in other ways in different poems, um, where he figures himself as an old man and talks about that. And in that case, he actually distances himself completely and has other people in the poem talking about him in the third person. So there are certainly ways in which he's using this rhetorically. But if the you is also us, but I mean, that changes the temporal, temporal yeah. framework quite a lot, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. if, mm -hmm. if, if we are the tree, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's an interesting provocation in the logic that you've been setting up. Yeah. I mean, exactly yes, exactly. thank you. But, uh, right, so, so if the tree is, you know, extempore, mm -hmm. in the sense mm -hmm. that Absolutely. we read it, yeah. we become the you. Uh -huh. And that, 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 that does something to the... That does something, right, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the image here. When the when the uh, poet reappropriates himself once again, I mean, uh, I would say that when Amuno is working in this poem um, and in many of the poems that he writes within kind of a as you say extemporaneal um, um, non temporal sphere um, of writing, where presumably he can speak in. Uh, as himself and to us. But is there a relationship between the extemporaneous and the simultaneous? Mm. Uh, yes. You see, that's how I'm thinking about phrasing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because exactly. you lay yourself open to it. Right. You see what I'm exactly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yes. Yes. And I think along those same lines, too, the album in Spanish can be used as a term of endearment, so that doesn't yes. necessarily say he's speaking about his own soul, but maybe saying, you, 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 you know, you know my soul. Absolutely. Love, beloved one. And that right. is a really good way to read this, the register of, mm -hmm. of his writing here. I, I wanted to know if you could return to your final slide about the Gongara celebration. Yeah, sure. I was reading the, the you said it was Damaso Alonso who had written the, the sort of, the description. Of uh, the, it was Gerardo Diego, actually. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering if, you could, if you could say something about, because I, it looks like it cut off there at the end, but yeah. after they burned the effigies, it looks like they had a book burning celebration. Absolutely, so this is the introduction to that, um, yes. And I wondered about the symbolic aspect of that book burning, uh -huh. how that might fit into your, your ideas, and also about the books themselves that they burned. Uh -huh. I work in Golden Age, so I saw the first book and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, I mean, what they're doing here is vindicating um, Gongora, so they have their specific reading, right? Um, and the text run through um, a mixture of anthologies that 
uh, excluded or didn't appropriately uh, treat Gongora. Exactly, yeah. Menendez y Pelayo later on, no? He's See, their the big enemy. The even once it's dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, well here, yeah, there's a, a division between a certain sort of um, poetic, eternal, right? Um, um, atemporal um, production that they, in their historical moment, are preserving. Um, and the rest is deemed to be that stuff of literary criticism, right, of, um, of the old and the, and the uh, petrified and the disposable, exactly. So, so that's what they're doing. It's really fascinating to go through the list of texts and see what they decided to keep and what not. And uh, luckily for what I'm trying to work on, Unamuno is very absent from all of this. And uh, in it's, a, it's a convention in Hispanism where it, uh, Unamuno has not been considered. I, I showed you the picture earlier. Uh, he is known for his white hair uh, and being an old man. Um, but uh, he was, I think, one of the most important poetic predecessors of a lot of these writers. <coughs> Yeah. This is a relatively open question, but I wanted to hear you speak a little bit more about the relationship uh, between corporeality and temporality in these mm -hmm. poems, and specifically the distinction you're following in symbolic terms between a tree and a crustacean. Mm -hmm. The crustacean, at least within your talk, seems more of a counterpoint to the tree than anything else. But are you also thinking about them in terms, thinking about these terms in terms of corporeal embodiment in the lyric poem as itself a kind of body and the way in which the history of the lyric poem between, let's say, the early 19th century and mm -hmm. the early 20th century mm -hmm. is also a history of the transformation of that body. Is this something that you're thinking about? Mm. Sort of, I mean, more uh, literal absolutely. corporeality or sensuality right. of these figures in relationship to the formal structure uh -huh. of the poems? Um, that's really fascinating to think about it that way. I have generally... Mm, that more in terms of intellectual history, right? And um, predominant metaphors in the, the writing itself. But mm, that would be really interesting to look at, I think. I mean, I'm working with the idea of the tree, right? Which is um, just uh, something that you can already take out from the romantics. Um, Unamuno's reading a lot of uh, the English romantics at the time, Coleridge, et cetera. Um, and, and that comes together very easily. The, the more physical, uh, direct relationship between the human body and the images is something, I don't know, do you have thoughts on that? Do you want to? Well, the first thing that comes to mind to me is the, almost the valorization of the exoskeletal in early mm -hmm. 20th century modern mm. poetry. I mean, you, you could even link it to sort of Adorno's essays on lyric poetry, where mm. he talks about poetry as a shield, and right, shield a yeah. kind of manner of protecting. So there's this sense of producing a double body or an exteriorization of the body mm -hmm. as itself the shell of the subject. And right. I'm wondering if that's not also being that's kind of anticipated and kind of, there's kind of paralogic there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I would think so, but maybe unconsciously so, right? Because um, these poets are uh, constantly uh, looking for ways, I mean, all of the story of youth in the modernist period is the breaking through of, you know, um, the shield, the obstacle, the, and the facade, right? Um, Benjamin talks in his essays on youth about the adult as wearing a mask, right? So it's always against that sort of turn. Um, but you're right. I mean, that is what increasingly what the poem is, is doing. I don't know. You could argue it um, both ways, I think. Great point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering to try to push that a little bit further. Um, I mean, during the same period, of course, you get other ways of kind of imagining and reimagining bodies and in relation to non-human mm -hmm. objects. Mm -hmm. kind of a, you know, you get the sort of mechanized body of the stuff, like say, all year. Yeah, absolutely. Um,
Well, yeah, you could really see it. It's, uh, that's also a great point. You could really see it as um, uh, anticipating mechanized images of the body in the avant-garde. Um, for my work, when you get to Jimenez Caballero, he will talk about racers wearing helmets, and he'll return to this idea of um, the shield and um, protecting the body in a very, uh, uh, within a fascist kind of concept um, of return to the avant-garde. Um, so I think there's definitely a connection there. And um, and again, it's I, I more and more see these two kind of strands of the, the proto or avant-garde um, and the modernists to diverge in these ways because they're just two models of um, physicality and, and materiality that don't seem to converge very often, if that makes sense. Could I just ask you to follow up on that distinction yeah. that you're making here between modernism and avant-garde? Yeah. I think it's implicit in a lot of work, but since you've been yeah. really establishing it as a, as a, as a distinction, I, I, I think that the idea that modern means of the now and the avant-garde suggests a kind of futurity, I mean, that, that, that seems to be the timeline that you're presuming mm. for that difference, but because it also yields itself to an entirely different set of metaphorics, mm -hmm. it's something, it involves something else other than temporality alone. So right. what, is, that, is that what the distinction is based on? So that modern means you know, squishy and organic, <laughs> and avant-garde means yucky and you know, discontinuous and mechanical? I mean, is that um, what the distinction is based on? Um, my distinction is based more on, uh, well, getting back to the combination of corporality and temporality that we talked about earlier, um, that working within modernist discourse in a way that the avant-garde rejects temporality altogether, right? So um, um, things become actually frozen in time and um, can only be shattered through violence, right, and through militant um, aesthetics. Would you agree? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you brought up Benjamin earlier, and I mean, the, the classic sort of discourse, right, is, is Benjamin talking about the or talking about the newspaper, uh -huh. right? The newspaper, you know, mm -hmm. that's not, even if it's hardly an avant-garde consideration, right? Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. like something about industrializing, you know, industrial modernity, industrializing mm -hmm. the way that we encounter things that might be shocking, mm -hmm. right? And that, that actually is a mechanical way to, you know, give us access to sort of the flowing of time. The end mm -hmm. of the news, right, mm -hmm. is not produced by, you know, dipping one's fingers in the river, but actually by reading something that's been mechanically produced. Mm -hmm. um, in which case, you know, shock becomes, you know, again, I'm not going to read no, this. No, no, no. So, I mean, again, I, it's, a, it's a distinction. I'm, I'm, I don't want to presume. This strikes me as a particularly, you know, your genealogy here is mm -hmm. consistent. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, but I'm just curious to sort of see how it sort of juxtaposes against something other than it, and, what that, and what's mm -hmm. based on that distinction that's, let's say, intrinsic to the, to the work. And there's a project, mm -hmm. right, that is about the kind of trans-historicity of, mm -hmm. of the youth. Yes, right? yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah, I, I, th I really do think that temporality within modernism and the avant-garde work in different ways. So that's where I tend to end up. Um, the avant-garde, I mean, it depends on who and what frame we're looking at, but um, uh, Peter Berger's uh, profound influence on, on the way avant-garde is, is thought, for better or for worse, um, does conceive of kind of a um, almost Hegelian teleology, right? That the avant-garde is the culmination of, right, the modern. Um, so I, I am working within that, that kind of opposition, I think. Just yes. to follow that comment on the, um, the question of what you were talking about, the notion of the exoskeleton and the robot mm -hmm. and the, the robotics of fascism, it seems to me that one thing that is sort of slightly taken here is the notion of the metaphor as embodiment without fashion. Mm. Right? Mm. So there's mm -hmm. a fabulous book on fascist, it's either called fascist virilities or fascist masculinities that mm -hmm. talks 
mm -hmm. a slightly more nuanced way, mm -hmm. where it's not an inside and an outside in as clear a way as the poets might have intended. Right. But there is a notion of fashion, and that fashion um, has a temporality which mm -hmm. develops in various different ways depending mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. um, how it's configured, even if it's not consciously configured in this poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is this, am I making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 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 Like the exoskeleton as later on becoming the fascist robotics, or the, the notion that a crust. Yes, there's the crustacean, but the crustacean um, is not just something that never sheds its own skin. It sheds it sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's different mm -hmm. possibilities. Right. In the binary of sure. the tree and the crustacean as they met first appear. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right, and going back to that, that first poem, I think that's fundamental, the idea of wearing several selves yeah. uh, and being able to take them off, right? That's what I'm getting at, too, with the ideas of, of modernist temporality. Yeah, that's what I mean, and, and the, the notion that fashion is not something necessarily that hides everything, but that it's mm -hmm. a way of rehearsing the mm -hmm. multiplicity of identity. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Which works yeah. against the notion that every identity has to be cut off by the Canadian language. Right. <laughs> 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 Who wasn't Canadian? <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the word we have in English. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's great, definitely. Yes. that has already been kind of assumed with Spanish literature from this period, uh, and other ways that that might be nuanced. So um, there's a lot of discussion in this period about the prevalence of poetry, right? That it's a, so you think of um, Jose Ortega Gasset, the dehumanization, dehumanization of art, right? Um, and the idea that youth is now in, everything that old is, is old is out, and also the poetic is what will prevail, even in, uh, and he makes that caveat, but even in the narrative. And along with that essay, he published one about the, the problems of the novel, ideas about the novel, right, in Spain, and talks about the, the failure of the novel, and that could be compared to, or linked to ideas of the nation, right, and with his work on the epic as well. Um, so I see kind of the, this distinction, the fact that poetry became the dominant genre of youth in this period as a uh, fundamental in understanding how Spain contributes to this broader phenomenon within modernism in Europe. But at the same time, there are other, um, there are certainly works that need to be studied and looked at more closely that go through these same um, processes. So for example, in 1910, there's a novel published by Ramon Pérez de Ayala um, called AMDG, and uh, um, so Ad Mayorem Gloriam uh, Deum, see exactly. Um, and it's about a Jesuit, it's about teenagers in a Jesuit school, right? So right six years before Joyce's novel is published. Uh, and that is certainly a novel that rejects the idea that doesn't have anyone reach a happy maturity at all. Um, and that, that's a phenomenon that again, has not been looked at throughout Spanish literature as much as in other traditions, particularly um, English, but others as well. So, yeah, let's see. AMDG is also right at the top of your composition. Yes, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's true. It's part of your education. Talking, yeah, yeah, absolutely, within the Jesuit mindset, yeah, which goes into all sorts of directions in um, the Spanish avant-garde as well. So. <laughs> Alright, well please join me in thanking you.